In November of 1995, Ishihara Tsunekazu led the creation of Creatures, Inc., an innocuous little company formed from the staff behind the Mother or Earthbound series, Ape, Inc. Ape had originally been made as a subsidiary of Nintendo to nurture new talent in the gaming industry, led by celebrity essayist and competitive Monopoly player Itoi Shigesato. Little changed for the company in the transition. The staff and corporate structure stayed largely the same. The one thing that was different was its purpose. Until this time, Ape had been assisting Game Freak, a former magazine-turned-game developer under the helm of upstart programmer Tajiri Satoshi. Under the mentorship of Mario creator Miyamoto Shigeru, Tajiri had spent the last five years developing pocket monsters Red and Green, the first games in what we now know as Pokemon. Ape had been partnered with Game Freak to expedite development, and the rebranding into creatures happened one month before Red and Green's final program was compiled in December. Three months after Ape became creatures, Pokemon Red and Green went on store shelves, but creatures was already turned to a new purpose creating Japan's first trading card game. When Red and Green came out in February 1996, it proved to be something of a unicorn for the game industry. To this day, most video games do the bulk of their sales in the first four weeks, and then vanish off the charts. But Pokemon had a disappointing week one, and instead turned into a steady seller eventually gaining momentum and repeatedly dipping in and out of first place on Famitsu Magazine's sales charts for 30 months straight, single-handedly reviving interest in the waning Game Boy. Ishihara personally oversaw the merchandising of the brand, its expansion into all aspects of daily life, from toothbrushes and pop-tarts to television and stamp rallies, and he exerted an aggressive degree of personal supervision over each and every element of the franchise, an effort that he later reflected on as being to ensure the sequel, then called called Pocket Monsters 2 and planned to be the final game in the series would be a success. But from the beginning, Ishihara had another plan for Pokemon. The man was an avid fan of Magic the Gathering, revealing in a September 2015 interview that he owned over 10,000 Magic cards, a claim also made in the Game Boy version of the Pokemon trading card game but without explicitly naming Magic. The question of to what degree Magic influenced Pokemon has been debated almost endlessly, as Pokemon has a particularly influential position as the first Japanese TCG, and is sometimes said to have been developed without external influence. But a 2006 study by Dr. Kimura Makoto of Waseda University uncovered that two employees of Star Corporation, a toy wholesaler working for Creatures Inc. at the time, were fully aware of the game's similarities to Magic. When Pokemon was demoed behind closed doors for Iwasaki Tetsuya and his boss, Kayama Tetsu, Kayama remarked on the game's similarities to Magic, leading Iwasaki, who had never heard of a trading card game before, to purchase English Magic the Gathering cards to compare the two games. While Magic was not available in Japanese in 1995 and was not officially localized at all until Hobby Japan picked up the game in 1996, The card shop Pengaya in Osaka City was a popular destination for hobbyists because it imported English sets from America. Magic the Gathering was easy to access if you already had basic English literacy, and as a collection of business people and programmers, Creatures Inc. as a whole was more than adept enough at English to be learning from Magic's example. Pokemon illustrator Arita Mitsuhiro implied as much in a 2016 interview where he recalled his first experiences working on the Pokemon TCG. He was recruited by a 3D illustrator working at Creatures, implied to be Kinebuchi Keiji, the designer of Pokemon's energy cards and the only other 3D illustrator to render for Pokemon's base set, to work on a, quote, RPG card game such as Magic the Gathering, end quote, which ultimately turned out to be Pokemon. Knowing all this, it's hard not to look at Creatures Inc. and wonder where lands, artifacts, enchantments, and Planeswalkers Inc. are. At the end of the day, the similarities between the two games were noticed primarily by hardcore hobbyists. To casual observers, Magic generally didn't register. The game wasn't localized in Japanese until 4th edition was brought over by Hobby Japan in April 1996, two months after the Pokemon Red and Green Game Boy games were on store shelves, and Magic struggled to go mainstream in Japan for many reasons. Four figures from Creatures played key roles in designing the Pokemon trading card game. Oyama Koichi, Akabane Takumi, Miura Akihiko, and the aforementioned Ishihara Tsunekazu. 
Ishihara created the original concept and designed the general rules of the game, picking elements from the Game Boy games he felt could transition well to the card game format, while Oyama designed trainer cards and acted as a mediator between staff members, testing and then accepting or rejecting ideas from them. Miura seems to be the one that created the game's win condition, among other miscellaneous game mechanics. His later TCG, Colossus Order, shares a number of mechanical similarities to Pokémon, chief among them its win condition of turning six gem cards face up. Akabane's role in the game is the most mysterious, but in a 20th anniversary interview, Ishihara referred to Akabane and Oyama being the driving forces behind the game's creation. Oyama is particularly notable because he went on to become the face of the game in Japan, assuming the identity of Professor Oyama going around the nation and promoting the Pokemon trading card game at events while in costume. His character was immortalized in the Game Boy Color adaptation of the TCG and localized overseas as Dr. Mason. Oyama himself was not a programmer, despite having worked for years in video games and having been a game designer on Mother 2. He knew nothing about code and instead did all of his work with pen and paper. For him, having the chance to design and playtest a game directly by writing out proxies with no need for computer expertise was a dream come true. The core rules of Pokémon were already finalized by mid-January of 1996, when Korokoro Magazine ran a special feature on it, but the final card effects weren't ironed out until some time after. While the original release date was in late September, Media Factory ultimately didn't publish the first booster set until October, overshooting their intended launch by a month. Because the Creatures team was working with what was essentially a prior discourse in terms of TCG design, the best way I find to approach the design history of Pokémon is to look at where it was coming from in relation to Magic. Now, if you're not familiar with the rules of Magic itself, the basics are very simple. Both players have 20 life. Each turn they can play one land from their hand, and to play creatures and spells they have to tap or turn sideways enough lands to match those cards' mana costs. If a card needs one green mana, you have to tap a forest. If it needs one green and one red, you need to tap a forest and a mountain. And if it needs two blue, you need to tap two islands. Simple. Each creature has a certain amount of power and toughness, with higher numbers requiring more mana to summon, and they can't attack the turn they're summoning. This gives both players a chance to prepare for the threats put into play, summoning creatures of their own to block those attacks. So in essence, it's a game about both players' resources growing over time as they place more lands, budgeting those resources on summoning creatures to whittle down their opponent's life to zero, and using spells to disrupt the opponent's plays or counter their own spells to make it easier for those creatures to deal damage. There are several strengths and weaknesses to this system. By tying the kinds of plays both players can make to their amount of lands on the board, magic reigns in the level of power either player can exert, so that they both have a similar level of power at any given stage of the game. It also prevents Scaled players from one. simply dumping the strongest cards they can find in their decks, because they have to include lots of lands and setup cards to make those strong cards playable. And by separating cards into five distinct colors that only work with lands of the same color, magic's designer, Richard Garfield, ensured that different deck types with distinct strategies would emerge, rather than having one single best deck that could do everything. However, the problems that Magic created were essentially endemic to the system and could never be gotten rid of without fundamentally changing the game. The separation of lands as a distinct card type created what's known as Mana Flood and Mana Screw, either drawing only lands and not being able to do anything, or not drawing enough lands and not being able to do anything. The position of Wizards of the Coast is that Mana Flood and Mana Screw are not actually problems, but are the game working as intended? These situations exist to punish players for bad deck building, and the only way to avoid them is to build your deck according to a sound mana curve that is mathematically the most likely to give you exactly as much land as you need throughout the game. No more and no less. But that doesn't stop Mana Flood or Mana Screw from happening to players who built their decks correctly. Improbable means it's unlikely to happen, not that it doesn't, and it never feels good when your deck just randomly bricks through no fault of your own. Pokémon's solution to the problems of Mana Flood and Mana Screw was to tether its version of lands, energy cards, to the attacks a creature carried out, rather than to the summoning cost of the creature itself, and have a whole class of cards with no cost, trainer cards. Under Pokémon's system, summoning creatures and casting spells, or rather, sending out Pokémon and using trainer cards, was costless. 
Higher power creatures were obtained by evolving your existing creatures into higher level ones, but a Pokémon could not be evolved in the same turn it was placed. This allowed power to still be scaled with the number of turns that had passed in the game, but with a lower risk of mana screw. Mana flood could still happen, but because the draw and search effects from trainer cards had no associated energy cost, Pokémon players could afford to run fewer energy cards in their decks than Magic players could lands. One of the key differences between Pokémon and Magic was the limitation placed on the number of creatures in play. In Magic, you could have an unlimited number of creatures out at a time, while in Pokémon you could have only one active Pokémon and five benched Pokémon. Pokémon on the bench did not battle, but could use support effects called Pokémon Powers and be swapped into the active position by having the active Pokémon pay a retreat cost in energy. All of this was tied into Pokémon's win condition, which is perhaps its greatest contribution to the world of TCGs. Instead of winning by reducing the opponent to zero life, you won by taking six prize cards. At the start of each game, the top six cards of your deck would be placed face down as prize cards, and every time your opponent's Pokémon was knocked out, you would add a prize to your hand. This was done as a way to convert the Pokémon Game Boy game's game mechanic of each trainer trying to knock out each other's full team into a TCG, but it ended up being a far more elegant system than life. The problem with Magic's life system goes back to a popular aphorism among Magic players. The only point that matters is your last one. Players in Magic are effectively able to disregard their life total much of the time, freely using it to pay costs or just ignoring any battle damage they receive up until the very last point. It's only through specific cards that exert pressure on the game through burn damage like Fireball that players have to start watching their life total and staying above a given threshold. In Pokémon, every knockout matters because it gives extra cards to the winner. This puts pressure on players to interfere with knockouts to avoid giving the opponent card advantage, which is the basic principle that the player who draws more cards in a game has more resources at their disposal and is thus more likely to win. That said, the prize system had weaknesses of its own. By rewarding knockouts with extra cards, Pokémon risked creating one side games, where one player's card advantage would snowball over time, becoming capable of delivering more knockouts simply by virtue of having already scored the previous one. There was no comeback mechanic by which a losing player could reverse the game state and come from behind. Many of the cards printed in Pokémon over the past 20 years like Scramble Energy, Rockets Admin, Twins, and N were created to address this by adding in a comeback mechanic that wasn't formally baked into the rules of the game, and subsequent game designers that followed in Ishihara's footsteps would try to invent convert the prize card mechanic in some way, to instead give an advantage to the losing player so that they would have an opportunity to bounce back. It also created the issue that you would never see the entirety of your deck in one game, because you won the moment the last prize card was taken, and if one or more vital cards spent the game prized, that could severely hamper your game plan. For 1996, though, prize cards were a huge step up from life systems, making the game both more visually legible at a glance and giving players a better sense of momentum. Snapping a prize card into hand after picking up a knockout was very satisfying, in a way that watching the opponent scratch out numbers on a notepad or rotate a die around could never be. Perhaps the biggest design failure of the Pokémon TCG was how underplayed its evolution mechanic became. The ability to evolve a Pokémon one stage higher was supposed to rein in the power scale, similar to the difficulty of playing high-cost, fatty monsters in Magic, but from the moment Pokémon's base set launched, the game's official tournaments were dominated by big, basic Pokémon. 